Good morning, everyone. Um, this is really a, a, a looking forward to this conversation with Alex Howard. Alex is the founder of the Optimum Health Clinic. Uh, this is situated in London, but luckily he does work um, on uh, Zoom and all other. Uh, you know, you can you can participate with Alex in lots of ways. But um, I interviewed him for one of our summits, and I was just so impressed uh, and excited by his work. In fact, it's on my list to actually take one of his courses. Um, so he has been working in the area of, um, how do you say, you know, I hate to use the word psychological because that that always um, uh, puts people on the wrong thing, but how to be alive. I think that's the thing is how to live your full life, you know, and, uh, and when you're, uh, if you're chronically ill, uh, that can sound like a challenge because you feel like, well, just surviving is, is, is work. But um, I think if you spend a little time listening to what uh, Alex has to say, you'll begin to understand how you can harness your, your own feeling states to um, help you heal and also just help you uh, embody and, and live a fuller life. So um, Alex, uh, tell us, uh, you know, about you a little bit and especially about um, your the various programs you have, because I think they're all so informative and uh, useful for people to like get a handle on their own on their own healing. Yeah, firstly, Eric, thank you. Appreciate you having me. It's, it's exciting to get a chance to talk to talk to you again, also talk to um, your community. So let me start by saying like a lot of people that are working in this space, and I'm sure many of the people which are joining us for this conversation, this wasn't the plan that I had for my life. Um, my, I think I wanted to be a rock star. My mother wanted to be an accountant, and neither of us got what we wanted. I wanted me to be an accountant, I should say. Um, and I found myself around my 16th birthday suffering from very debilitating um, fatigue symptoms. And in time, that was diagnosed as ME or chronic fatigue syndrome. And spent the first couple of years of that journey desperately waiting and hoping for someone else to find the answers. I went and saw numerous different um, medical doctors, alternative practitioners. This was back in 1996. Um really looking for the answer, like the cure, like the thing that's going to be the answer. And a couple of years into that, um, it wasn't that I was actively planning how I was going to end my life, but I'd certainly lost any sense of hope for my future. And, you know, when as many people will know on on, on this um, call, when you're suffering from completely debilitating fatigue, um, you're exhausted all of the time. And then you can't sleep at night, even though you're exhausted, muscle pains, headaches, dizziness. And when I reached that point of desperation, really, I had a conversation that helped me realize that if I wanted the circumstances of my life to be different, if I wanted to find a way out of the situation that I was in, then I was going to have to be the one to drive that. Now, I was 18 years old at the time. Um, so this is now is it 26 years ago. Um, I didn't have a lot of things going for me. I didn't have money. I didn't have energy. I didn't have um, access to good info. Like, you know, back in back in those days, you had to go to a library and order in a book. It wasn't like going on the internet and all the information sort of at, at your fingertips. Um, but I did have one thing, and that was time. Um, because... I was basically just waiting for my life to to be different. And so that became a five-year healing journey. And on that way, and I guess that's maybe <clears throat> part of what we'll get into in this conversation, what I realized is there is no one answer, well, there are as many answers. And for each person with a chronic illness, each person on a trauma healing journey, really each person that comes into my work, your work, and um, in, into this world, it's not about finding the cure or the answer it's about decoding what's going on finding the jigsaw pieces and putting those together and that collectively really becomes the building blocks of of our recovery so that's a little bit about my background and then i went on to set up over 20 years ago now the optimum health clinic it's now one of as you know one of the world's leading interest medicine clinics we have patients in over 50 countries around the world we have a team of, of um, 25 full-time clinicians 
Um, and in terms of my programs, I, I think we'll talk a little bit um, as we go through about my reset program. It's a 12 week online coaching program. It's really designed to help us to reset our nervous system and cultivate a healing state, which really unlocks many of the other pieces of that healing journey. Yeah. What I, what I love um, uh, about, you know, your work and just the way you said it is it's kind of the same approach that we have found is that there is no one answer. Okay. And you're willing to use information from everywhere. There's so, I mean, like, you know, like it's um, the eclectic nature of it is so important because what resonates in one person doesn't in another and putting things in the right order, I think is so important in, in a, as people are healing. Um, and just, but understanding, can you talk a, a little bit about the, um, how do you say, um, you know, there's so many points that I personally find. I mean, I'm old and it's amazing how you can dance through life. Um, and if you have energy, you can keep moving so fast that you don't have to really be present. And, um, and so can you just talk about, uh, you know, the, the different aspects of how people avoid life? Yeah. Yeah. One way to think about it is for our body to heal, we have to be in a healing state, right? It's like we think about, um, we can talk more about the nervous system, but to put it in very simple terms, our nervous system can be in a state of stress, like a state of dysregulation, like fight, flight, freeze, or it can be in a state of regulation. It can be in a healing state. And for our physical body to heal, we need to be in a healing state. Same is true for our emotional body. When we're in a state of dysregulation, when I went, what I call a maladaptive stress response, what I mean by that is a healthy stress response that's become maladaptive. So, like to, to give context to that, let's say you and I are walking down the down the street here in in London, and we now have electric buses, so those big red buses that people sort of um, sort of are used to seeing in London. Some of them are now electric, so you don't hear them. So you and I are walking down the street. We don't hear the big red bus coming towards us. And then suddenly one of us notices it. We had a massive hit of adrenaline, a fight-flight response. And then we leap out of the way to survive the danger, the threats of um, of that, that, that bus. And in that moment, our healthy stress response kicks in, right? So we get a hit of adrenaline, cortisol. Our blood flow goes to our arms and to our legs, away from our digestion, to allow us to survive the danger and the threat. The problem is when the threat doesn't go away or actually more often the perceived threat doesn't go away. So sometimes the danger and the threat is not necessarily a real threat. It's a perceived threat in our mind and a learned danger in our nervous system. So when we're in that state of maladaptive stress response, we're therefore not in a state of healing. There's a whole bunch of bodily processes that change from that. And again, we, we can unpack some of that. But just to specifically answer your question, when we're in that state, we're constantly trying to get away from where we are right now. We're trying to get into our mind away from our body. We're trying to get into the figuring out the risks and the dangers of the future rather than being here in the moment. And being in that state one of the you know one of the questions people often ask is you know what why did i get sick like why why is my body um unwell and in a way it's it's not always the right question often the right question is what's stopping my body from healing living in an ongoing state of maladaptive stress response but another way living in an ongoing state of nervous system dysregulation is really a blocker to our natural capacity to heal, right? Like there's, just to kind of give a couple of bits of, of example of that, a very simple example, if we cut our skin or we break a bone, there's no drug that we take that makes that heal. There may be drugs that deal with infection, drugs that help manage pain, but the actual healing of that skin or the healing of that bone is a natural process, we don't need a cure there. We need to make sure nothing gets in the way of that process. That there's not infection or whatever, or whatever um, it, it may be. 
Another way of thinking about it is when we're in that chronic state of nervous system dysregulation, many of the other interventions that we may be using are often blocked or not effective, right? You find that people are reacting to all the supplements that are supposed to help them. They're reacting to all the foods that are meant to help them. It's like they're tired, but they're wired the whole time. And all that energy is going into fueling that wired state. Therefore, there isn't that depth of healing that actually needs to be happening. Yeah. What, what, <clears throat> what I, I'd like to emphasize, and I, I know you make the point also, um, is that anxiety and, and fear don't make you sick, but they can keep you sick. And I think that's what so many people um, react to the idea that they need uh, or that they could benefit from help in balancing their nervous system because the the story they've been told, it's they're sick because of their psychological issues. And I can tell you, I used to do geriatrics and I took care of lots of very, very, very lifetime anxious people who were 70 and 80 years old and were just fine. Okay. <laughs> it's it's when you add a chronic, that means an illness that has not healed, that you have not completed the healing process. And um, I, I, well, I'm going to let you talk or you can fit in here. Um, and most of the people who are listening to this have heard me um, go on and on about uh, the cell danger response and, and Dr. Navio's work, which um, just weaves so nicely through your, um, your understanding of how people heal. But it's this place of, you know, there's no blame here. It's like, you know, we're all wired. And if you can be wired, I'm a very wired person. Thank God I I haven't had a chronic illness. So I can be kind of off. But, um, you know, but... Well, let, yeah, sorry to interrupt you. I just, I just want to really unpack this point around yeah. sort of around psychology and, and physical health conditions. Yeah. Because, look, I get it. When I was um, 16 years old and diagnosed with with ME or chronic fatigue syndrome, one of the first things I was told to do was to have counselling with a with a counsellor, and there was some research program that was going on. And I don't think I've ever felt so unseen and so un uh, not because they were an unpleasant person, but it was like I have a physical illness. And you want me to talk to someone about the fact I have a physical, I don't even want this goddamn illness, let alone want to talk about it. So I think it's really important to, to make a, a point here that when we're talking about the role of the nervous system and the role of psychology in physical conditions, there's a few things that we don't mean. And I think it's helpful to, to, to name those. So number one, you have people that go and see uh, psychiatrists that go and see sort of, you know, arrogant mainstream doctors who will say, I can't find anything wrong with you. Therefore, there is nothing wrong with you, right? Which, of course, is the highest level of arrogance because the assumption is they know everything there is to know about the human body. And if they can't find anything wrong, therefore, there isn't anything that anyone else is going to find that's wrong. So firstly, when I'm talking about the role of psychology in the nervous system, I'm not talking about those situations where people are saying there is no illness, you've just got negative thoughts and you're manifesting this illness through those negative thoughts. I'm also not talking about, um, for example, um, you hear about it less these days, but certainly a lot of the um, research on um, some psychological approaches going back sort of 30, 40, 50 years ago, we talk about phantom limb pain. This would be where someone has lost the limb for some reason, but they still have pain in that in that limb, which of course is not possible because the limb doesn't exist anymore, and so therefore it's a construct of the unconscious mind. It's not it's not real. That's also not what we're talking about here. We are talking about measurable, researchable states of illness. It's just that we have to have the right measures and the right ways of of understanding what's happening. So we have real things that are happening in the physical body. And as you rightly said, it isn't necessarily that a state of panic and anxiety is causing those things. It may be a factor in causation, but it may only be a small factor. It may be a, not a factor at all. It's that our body has a natural capacity to heal. But for that healing capacity to be online, our nervous system has to be well regulated. Otherwise, our resources are going in to fuel that state of dysregulation. And when I came across um, Dr. Robert Navio's work um, 
maybe uh, five or six years ago now, I was like, finally, someone has been able to give a deep scientific explanation of what we've been seeing for, at that point, the last 15 years clinically, that we've been identifying and we've been able to, to have intervention that are, interventions that are effective to address. Um, so he and I are definitely saying the same thing, just with different perspectives, but it's the same core mechanism. Yeah, yeah. No, energy, <laughs> healing, energy, healing, self-defense. I mean, this is how the body works. And, um, you know, chronic illness is is really just when those self-protective mechanisms don't turn off, you know, and um, I always and I, I'd like you to you know, talk a little bit about that, because I use those. Um, I often tell people it's easier to understand um, how the body works when we explain it in psychological terms than it is sometimes because the biochemistry, you, you know, if, you, if that's not your field, you're quickly lost. But we all understand what it's like to watch ourselves, and if we don't good at, not good at watching ourselves, other people engage in um, uh, sometimes self defeating, but just not self healing activities. You know, when in order to heal, you have to um, turn on a lot of uh, inflammatory chemicals, and then you have to turn them off. And it's not turning them off that causes chronic illness. And, um, and unfortunately, uh, as above, so below, when it, 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 the nervous system, your emotions uh, control your healing at the end of the day, once you remove the, uh, the arrow from the arm, let's say, you know, once that once the acute event is gone, so let's say you've gotten rid of the infection that maybe has triggered or the infection, uh, your immune system has treated the infection that caused your illness. But if you can't get the healing, the final all safe, it's okay to turn down and like go back to normal life, that message from the brain, that area will never fully return to normal use and normal function. And so how do you address that in your, you know, in, in, on the psychological, um, I hate to use, again, that psychological term um, can, can be such a turnoff to people, but on just the, how do you, how do you engage life with um, and, and get your, get your body to begin to um, live those concepts of that it's safe? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I want to answer that from a couple of different perspectives. The first thing I want to say is when we're dealing with um, chronic illnesses, one of the things I think it's important to be aware of is they often fall in the category of what we would call medically unexplained illnesses. Now, it doesn't mean that they are unexplained. It means in a mainstream medical world, they often have a, a lack of, of good answers. That leaves us in a state of massive uncertainty. It leaves us constantly wondering, what's wrong with me? Why is it wrong with me? Will I ever recover? Should I do more? Should I do less? Should I do this treatment, that treatment? So suffering from a medically unexplained illness in of itself is highly dysregulating to our nervous system. To go back to your, your question, Eric, about, about safety. So we all have three core emotional needs. These are not nice to have. They are as important to our emotional development as things like food, oxygen, and water are to our physical development. Like when these core emotional needs are not well met in childhood, then we don't develop in the optimum ways that we would hope to. Also, when they're not met in childhood, we don't have the foundations but us then being able to meet those needs for ourselves then through our through our adult life. So just briefly, these core emotional needs are the need for boundaries. That's the ability to say yes, but also the ability to say no. And that's external boundaries with other people, but also internal boundaries with ourselves. So for example, I need to stop this unhealthy habit or behavior, or I need to commit to this new thing that I need to start. Second of these core emotional needs, if I'm going to flip them because I'm going to come to safety last, would be, would be love. This is not love for what we do or what we achieve. It's love for who we are as we are. And it's that love that we 
if we're very lucky, we get in childhood that becomes the core foundation for our self-esteem and our self-worth. When we don't get these core emotional needs met, by the way, we develop coping strategies to try to compensate. And it's often those that cause a lot of our suffering. But the third of these core emotional needs that kind of goes back to to, to your question is the core emotional need for safety. This is, in, if for a baby, it's co-regulation in their nervous system. It's having caregivers that are in a calm, soothing state. When the baby gets distressed, they can come back to that soft and that safe and that holding place. And then as we go through childhood and through teenage years, it's knowing that we are not just physically safe, but we're emotionally safe to feel what we feel. When we don't get that met, we don't develop this capacity to self-regulate our nervous system. So when we get impacted and and sort of overloaded by life, maybe at traumatic experiences, we don't have that place inside of us to come back to where we can self-soothe. And so a lot of what is at the heart of learning how to not just heal past traumas, but to create to turn off this maladaptive stress response or to turn off cell danger response is to learn how to build that safety in our nervous system now. Yeah. And the, again, the parallels are are so important for people to, um, to, to grasp that it's the compensation that is keeping you ill. Okay. Um, We, you know, we're so stuck in the model of the insult is the problem. And no, the insult isn't the problem. The, the, your response to the insult is what is causing the ongoing issues. And, um, but I, I want to digress for one second. Well, cause one of the, a lot of people I'm, I'm seeing in the chat and I, I get this recurrent, recurrent question is, you know, all these things sound good, but it's sort of how do you find your way in when everyday life, when, you know, especially so many people with chronic illness um, are facing, you know, chronic financial stresses, just mm-hmm. just, just um, life on the physical plane, besides being uncomfortable, it's, it's stressful. How are we going to, you know, pay for shelter and food? And so people always go like, how do I find some thing in there when the lion is at the door. (laughs) So can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah. Firstly, um, many folks are in really just difficult circumstance, right? So I just want to acknowledge that, that it's easy for you and I to sort of stand here or sit here and, and um, talk about these, these, these things in a sort of um, sort of, intellectual way but may sound like it's absence of the empathy of people's circumstance and certainly i recognize you know i I said in my own story one of the challenges was i knew things that i could do that i thought would help i didn't have the money to be able to do those things so that is a very challenging part of the journey and i would say the majority of people the vast majority of people that i've worked with over the last 20 plus years have not been in an ideal circumstance. And when I say an ideal circumstance, I mean, you know, financial sort of ease, um, people around them that really get and understand their condition and can be really supportive to them, practical help that they need, flexibility that when they have more capacity, they can do things, but no one's worried when they... So most people don't have the ideal situation to support their recovery. But it doesn't mean that they can't still find a pathway forwards on their recovery. And we have to work with the circumstance that that we've got. And one of the ways that I like to talk about it is that, in a way, two things can be simultaneously true. Thing number one is that we are a victim of a horrible situation and it's not our fault. I mean, my last book was called It's Not Your Fault. Like, I'm I'm obviously totally in support of people um, recognizing they're not to blame and that their situation is difficult. But something else is also true, that it's not our fault, but we do ultimately have to be responsible for our own healing work. And we have to work with the circumstance that we have, however challenging or difficult it may be. Yeah, that that 
it is is so true, so difficult to to sometimes for people to sometimes swallow when you feel like your your light when you feel total lack of control, you know, and and so it's that first step of of getting that responsibility is not blame, yeah, and and. Yeah. And that's where, um, I, for me, what I, I have often heard in, in, in your talks and your lectures, uh, the, the importance of going back to um, those early places, say for me personally, is those, those, those little boy places where, you know, I still know now when, when things annoy me and I'm suddenly like really angry and like it's nothing. Like, and I, I, you know, if I get quiet enough, I can see this raging five-year-old who nobody listened to, you know, but it's like, as an adult for a long time, I just thought, you're not hearing me. <laughs> and, 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 and it's, I mean, so what I'm always surprised about is, um, I don't want to say this is a, this will sound terrible because there's no gift in being ill. I mean, like I would do not wish illness on anyone as the learning tool. Okay. I mean, uh, I, I, yes, <laughs> I, I always say like, I, I always want to have the finger of the Lord try to push me forward, not the two by four. The two by four is, <laughs> is, is, is when you get sick, when your life is interrupted, you know, and, um, and, and that is not, I, I said, I, I don't want to say that it, that's ever a good thing, but from that, from being defeated in, 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 in being able to, um, continue your normal coping strategies. There is the possibility of of something really good coming out of that. And and I I said I I, I say that with much trepidation to people who are actually not able to to live their lives because they're ill. Um, so there's no gift that I wish that on anyone. But still, in that, you you um, can you speak a little bit about meeting that that firm edge that most of that, that people who, who can like distract themselves by their everyday lives can avoid meeting. Yeah. Yeah. I think you put it well. Um, no one chooses to be on these journeys. Yeah. Yeah. And what we do get to choose is the meaning that we place upon it. Right. And it doesn't mean that that meaning is necessarily right or wrong. But if the if the meaning of the story is only that we have been a victim of bad things that have happened, the outcome of that story is that we are weakened and diminished in our life. If the meaning we give to that story is that some really bad, difficult, horrible things happened, but we chose to go on a journey of healing, that's a much more empowering way of looking at it. And maybe that journey has given us gifts. And it's not about saying, oh, because there were gifts on the journey, that makes it okay. It still doesn't make things that happen that shouldn't happen okay, but we can still choose to take an empowering meaning from those experiences. That You, you have done a lot of, of work recently with um, many uh, people who I, I can consider them healers, but people talk in the mindfulness world and people um, from, from uh, you know, many traditions. Um, and I just, just can you just talk a little bit more how that's impacted your, your, your worldviews? Cause we're sort of just almost touching on it there. And I just like to hear a little bit more about that. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, I've had a personally had a meditation practice for over 25 years and, um, I wouldn't say it's been perfect or consistent every day, week, month, and year, but certainly it's been a sort of key um, staple of of my personal inner work. Um, the ability to cultivate a certain amount of presence, a certain amount of ability to really be here, present, connected in the moment, is really important because one of the impacts of, of we haven't really used the word trauma so far but one of the impacts of of trauma in a very broad definition of that word is that we learn that we find safety by not being present right we go for experiences where either things are frightening or our needs are not met or we don't feel safe so we find safety or we attempt to find safety in disconnection but as you spoke to um, earlier, one of the challenges is that much of the suffering that we actually experience is not the issue. 
it's the things we do to avoid the issue, right? It's like to put that in a slightly different way. When we have unprocessed emotional trauma from the past, one of the ways we escape and we avoid those feelings, particularly if we couldn't leave the situation, we couldn't leave physically, we leave psycho-emotionally, like we leave in, in, in ourselves. So we disconnect from our body and we go more into our mind. Often what we try to do is we try to think our way to a feeling of safety. It's like we're trying to, the safety that's missing in our nervous system, the safety that's missing in our body, we're trying to get that in our mind. And then we have a whole bunch of symptoms that come from that. Physical symptoms, emotional symptoms, um, nervous system symptoms. And an import, for many people, an important part of their healing journey is reconnecting to their body, their physical body, their emotional body. And that is a journey that we go on. And meditation or mindfulness is part often of that jigsaw uh, i i one one th one thing that i often hear um and I, I, from people and i i know in my own in my own mind i do the same thing is that we um when we're confronted with people like you who are, who are trying to guide us to something more uh to feeling to being able to um, control these feelings of fear and anxiety um and and just even to get a to get a handle on a chronic pain that you know you just get something that keeps gnawing at you and you know you want to be able to get a different relationship to it um and we're always what happens is that we think about it and can you talk a little bit about how we can get out of the thinking mind? Because that that's the trap is that, you know, when we're just talking, we're, we're thinking and we think, oh, but I can't think my way out of this because this is what I'm in. And, and I think that's a, a, a circle of, of, of a thought circle. And I'd love you to unpack that if you can. Yeah, sure. Well, firstly, thinking is an inherently wrong, right? The issue is when, our mind and our nervous system is running too fast and we don't feel well equipped to regulate it and, and to slow things down. So I talk about this as, as what I call the safety loop. We feel unsafe in our body. So our mind speeds up as we try to think our way to a feeling of safety, which means we then disconnect more from our body. So we feel even more unsafe so our mind speeds up even more, trying to think our way to that feeling of safety. The thing is that safety is a feeling, and it's a feeling that comes when we feel safe, when our nervous system is calm, when our nervous system is well-regulated, then there's a natural arising of a, of a sense of ease, a sense of safety, a sense of groundedness, a sense of being connected in the moment. And so often what people try and do is they try to force their nervous system to that place of safety, right? They try and think their way there. They're looking for practices or, or drugs or interventions that can sort of push on themselves to that place. How I look at it is we want to understand what's driving us away from that place in the first place. What's the, the beliefs, what's the thought patterns, the behavioral patterns, the triggers to our nervous system? Like what's causing us effectively to disconnect so we can work on that layer and then build the safety to allow ourselves to reconnect? And it's, I think, but also um, finding that place uh, between when you're, Noting, noting that I guess maybe finding to be able to get that witness state so you can actually see um, when it's a feeling that you're having and when it's the amplification of that momentary feeling that the mind is doing. I mean, so it, it's, how do you weave that in? I mean, that, 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 that seems like, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a lifetime practice, but when you're asking people to do this, when... Um, they're often living in a bit of a, a washing machine of 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 um, bodily feelings 
that are easily misinterpreted by the mind. And so they just drive, you know, when your heart, when your heart is beating fast, just sitting there because you're not, not that you're not doing anything. How do you help people integrate that information? Yeah. I'm going to ask that question by, um, Bring in a bit of a framework because I think I think it helps give a bit more context because it because mm. it, it 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 sounds like a simple question but actually it's got a few jigsaw pieces to it so um, this is a framework that I call reset and reset sort of describing what we're trying to do we're trying to reset the nervous system but it's also an acronym of five steps we need to take um, along the way so the first one the R of reset is we need to recognize what is happening. Like we need to recognize in the first place that our nervous system is dysregulated. And that sounds like a simple point, but actually it's not. I remember the early years of the Optimum Health Clinic and people would come in for um, appointments and I would be talking about sort of early ways of trying to explain some of this nervous system stuff. And people's nervous system, a person's system might be so dysregulated, they can't even sit still. Like they're sort of bouncing off the walls in this maladaptive stress response. And as an empathetic person, I can feel my own nervous system becoming dysregulated by being around this person. But I try to might try to explain it to them, and they go, "Yeah, it makes total sense." But that's not true for me. My system's not dysregulated because the thing is, they've become so habituated and so normalized to the state that they're in that they don't even recognize the state of dysregulation in the first place. So the first thing is the R of reset. We've got to really recognize what state our system is in and what is happening. The second step, the first E of reset, is we've got to examine why is that happening? Like what are the building blocks that are driving that state of dysregulation in the nervous system? What are the defense mechanisms, the coping strategies, the belief systems? What's all the stuff that's driving that? Then the third step is we've got to have techniques to stop those patterns from running. And you go back to your your previous question, Eric, around um, meditation and mindfulness. So to me, like this, this is like a two part thing. One of which is, yes, we need uh, practices that help us self regulate. So ways that help us calm the nervous system. But the second is we need uh, strategies or techniques that when we become dysregulated, when those triggers, when those patterns come in, that we can recognize them, we can stop them, and we can practice retraining our system. It's like if every time we go from point A to point B, we catch it and we choose to go to point C, we do that enough times and that becomes the new pattern. So like the science of neuroplasticity tells us we can rewire and retrain our nervous system. We then come to the second E of reset. And I think this is also important. It kind of ties up some of the other questions you're asking as well. So when we feel unsafe emotionally, when we're feeling feelings and emotions that are not seen and not held by the environment around us, we disconnect. The feelings don't go away, so we go away. And that's that state we were talking about a few minutes ago when we go into that sort of constant thinking state to get away from the feelings. So if we just have practices to, to sort of stop the patterns, meditation, mindfulness, and we don't work on our emotional healing, we spend years just constantly trying to calm the system, but we need to do the emotional healing to stop what's driving the system up in the first place. And that means learning how to feel and to metabolize our unprocessed emotional history. Those traumas, those events, those things that have impacted us that we haven't healed, we need to learn how to do that healing. That brings us to then T, which is the, the fifth step of reset. We then have to transform our relationship with ourselves we have to cultivate that state of self-love and that caring, kind, um, supportive internal world. And we've got to create healthy boundaries with other people in our life. And often as we go on our healing journey, that can trigger all kinds of things in our family, friendships, and so on. And so to really transform how we're in relationship with everyone else, because that is what supports the longevity of our own healing. Yeah. Yeah. And, and what I want to emphasize for people as I'm listening to you is that 
everything we're talking about is not saying that there's not a need to, I would say, to remove the arrow. If, no. if, if you have, you know, pots and your heart rate is racing just because you're, you're sitting up, yes, you, you, it will help if you don't go into panic, but um, you do need um, either, you know, volume or medicine to keep that heart rate down. But the question is, and the whole point of this discussion is the other tools that you can then use to let your body know that the war is over. Because the problem that we that we all have, and especially when we're chronically ill and the and 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 you stay in a state of of unsafety and discomfort on the physical plane for a long time, is that our basic neurotic habits, which we all have, I've never met a normal person yet. Okay. <laughs> let, let me do Let me know if you do though. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, we're all, we all have, you know, we've all had, you know, um, you know, that moment when our parents didn't attend to us at the moment that we needed. Now they didn't know that that was the special moment for us. You know, it's, it's life, you know, just like, uh, you know, uh, anyway, there's, there's so many stories when, when you say the wrong word at the wrong time, which is just a passing comment and it crushes another human being. You know, I mean, if you have you, most of us have been on either end of that at one time or the other. Just know the randomness of because we don't know the other state. And so but but I guess the point I'm trying to make in this little ramble is that, yes, we need to attend to the body. But when the body's been sick for a while, our basic compensations for life, the neuro, what I call the neurotic tendencies are our, our habits to think too much, talk too much, withdraw too much, whatever, however you're wired, your own wiring gets amplified. If you tend to be anxious, you're going to get more anxious. If you tend to be depressed, you're going to get more depressed. If you, you know, so, cause those are, those things are your body's compensations. And um, where, what I love about Alex's work is that it gives you the tools and and that's what you talk a little bit more is is a toolbox because um again we always like people who kind of mirror parts of ourselves so um, is that um i'm very eclectic in how i approach because i know that everything works sometimes when it comes to you <laughs> yeah. you know uh i i i you know i've just been amazed at how people will heal so it's not that i can tell you do this so i'm always looking for new ways because different people need different tracks. And um, what I've been kind of impressed by your program is how you take in pieces from other programs that you feel, oh, I can fit this in here. You know, I can fit this strategy in, this technique, and I can teach that technique to help get over this hump for some people. And, and I, I just, if you'd like to speak to that at all, I just think that's really cool because so many people um you know that sense of this is my program yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that's what you're going to get yeah yeah so the origins of the reset program which is my 12-week online coaching program and i can see that darcy's been posting some links to that um in the chat is for about 15 years every other week so twice a month about 24 times a year we had an in-person group of people come to our offices in London at the Optimum Health Clinic, typically like six to eight, sometimes 12 people at a time. And we would take them through an in-person program, teaching them the core uh, frameworks and tools that they needed to effectively reset their nervous system. And the goal in this, this the, the origins of this was to have the most comprehensive framework possible to be effective without a single piece too much right like how simple can we get it to ensure we have all the pieces that we need for that program to really work and so when you have 24 times a year for 15 years in-person groups of people going through something and every single person provides a feedback form afterwards every single person is on ongoing one-to-one -one work with one of the clinicians delivering the program you really figure out what works and what doesn't work. And so 
the methodology that we use is called therapeutic coaching, which includes elements of a psychotherapeutic approach with a solution-based coaching methodology. And as we've developed that framework, we've constantly looked at what's missing, what needs to be emphasized differently, and probably the hardest piece, how do you fit all these pieces together in a way which makes it greater than the sum of the parts on their own, not just a hot mess of loads of stuff that just kind of constantly is in contradiction. So it's a very cohesive, um, integrative framework, which has been proven for many, many, many years. And, and now since we launched the online version in, I think it was 2019, so five years ago, we've had many, many thousands of people go through the online program, which we're currently on version three of. So every few years, I will take the feedback and I'll tweak it and I'll update it. And we've just we've just recently released the, the latest version. Yeah, well, with the, um, I think it's time. I, I it's, Some of the questions um, are excellent. And, and I want to go back to them because they, they, you know, one of the, one of the problems of talking about things that you think about all the time <laughs> is that um, you think about them all the time. So you don't realize the, the, the process involved in getting there. Um, yeah. and, and so there's a few, somebody asked a very good question um, uh, that I just want to clarify. It seems that, that, that emotional states are caused by biochemical or energetic imbalances or pathogens, you know, and, and I, I think that they're saying this as though we're ignoring that piece. And I, I think we want to emphasize, you no, know, we know that. Yes, we're not telling you that you're going to overcome um, your emotional states that are um, secondary, that they're all secondary to biochemical processes. Um, but the amazing thing about the body is that um, there are, and I, I thought before I talk about this, I'm going to have Alex answer this because I think it's, you'll, you'll give it a little more justice about, you know, what, that there's not a difference, but how do you, um, help the body find a way to change its biochemistry, I guess would be an interesting yeah. twist on yeah. that. Yeah, well, it's an interconnected loop. What's happening in our body impacts our mind, but what's happening in our mind impacts what's happening in our body. And so you have to look at both those pieces of the jigsaw. Um, well, each of those pieces is probably its own jigsaw, and then you have to look at how it all fits together into, into one, one big jigsaw. But to really understand how all this comes together, in a way, if we can really work to calm, to regulate, to reset the nervous system, we're really maximizing the potential of our physical healing. And if we only do that, and we're not addressing things on a physical level, then we may be calming the system, but we're not necessarily giving the body what it needs to then be able to do its healing work as well. Yeah. The... um. I, I think I think this is just so important to emphasize that you know if you have uh, like you say if you have Babesia or Bartonella those are bugs that we do a lot with they really can change um, they can create black depressions I mean just like the yeah. the um, you know uh, it just suck all the life I mean actually suicidal depression I mean really severe yes yeah, so. Um, if you can find yourself, it doesn't mean that 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 empty feeling is going to go away and it's not going to be scary, but it's not going to stay. It doesn't stay. I've seen this with people who've done their work. It doesn't stay as long. And when it's there, even though it feels terrible, they're able to get some distance from it. They don't, it doesn't become the only reality they have at that moment. It, it's like, there's more space in, in, in the possibilities. So yes, you have to deal with the physical. You have to deal with your infections or, um, you know, your organ, any organs that have been damaged. But while you're dealing with that at the end of the day, if you stay super anxious, super depressed, super uptight, you're just going to make it harder to heal. Doesn't mean you can't. Okay. I mean, uh, I have met many very unhappy people who heal fine. Okay. So we don't all have to uh, uh, attain a, a higher state to heal, but it's just a lot easier to get there if your mind is not stopping you. If your pattern of thought 
is not getting in the way. If every time you have a, a, a setback, you don't spiral down into either woe is me or I'm really angry at you or the world or Trump or whatever your target is for that's the cause of my, of my being this. Yeah. I mean, and anyway, so, so yeah, I mean, just, 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 just to add something to that, Eric, as well, that I can see a few folks asking about long COVID and Lyme, obviously you mentioned um, co infections, yeah. how that all kind of connects um, from my perspective. Certainly the way that we work in, in the optimum health clinic is that, you've got to work on both levels, right? A lot of people work in your community are doing really good work on the physical side with, with, with you and, and, and your team. Um, the piece we're talking about here is not instead of that, the piece we're talking about here is to optimize, accelerate and support that. And what we found in, in our clinic is when we just work on the physical side and we don't work on the nervous system, we often find that people react to interventions, interventions, people don't sustain recoveries they're on, people get a bit better, then they crash again. And so it's that co-intervention um, which we find is so effective. And yeah, and that is is needed. There's two questions. I mean, there's a few here that are really good. Um, I'm gonna, I want. I'm not gonna. I'm gonna get some quick answers for. Um, the question of uh, whether people need body work to get rid of the armoring in the body that that comes along with. Um, well, people. This question was from abuse, but basically that comes from just living and um, living in our modern world where we don't use our bodies, so we harden into these. Um, <laughs> shapes that uh, we see walking around yeah so from our from our perspective um body work can have a really helpful place the way that we work in the reset program is we work a lot with the body but we work with the body from the perspective of how do we build safety in the nervous system that supports the body in healing itself Right. And sometimes we need to also do direct work with the body as well. So it's not it's not to negate that. But also people can do many years of body work, but their nervous system is is constantly driving more issues into the body. So my experience is if we work with the nervous system piece, we do the emotional healing piece that has a dramatic impact on the body in of itself. And, and uh, we, we, as usual, we go both ways at it because um, when your muscles are tight, when the structure, and, and this is something actually, I think we have another webinar coming up because I love structure. I studied osteopathy for a year and I, I just think it's crucial because without drainage, without having, then the brain doesn't drain and it can't relax. So it's crucial. But again, these are all crucial pieces. And luckily we don't all have to do all of them, but do as many as you can. And centering your your being will get you the most bang for your buck. Um, and uh, it, it, it's it, it's one of the the, the um, I, I think one of the themes that I'm seeing in, in in some of the questions is just I'm so wound up. How can I possibly get out of this mess? Either you know one person uh, has severe hyperacusis, so any kind of noise just sets off their nervous system. You know, um, so it, it's I think the answer is kind of the same, but I think if you could reframe it for like, you got to start somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I'm, if it's OK, with you, I'm, I'm going to knock off about three or four different questions just with some kind of like really yeah. short answers. Yeah. I, th yeah. I, I, th I think I think it's it's probably helpful. So it's like if we've got loud noises triggering the nervous system. What that's telling us is the nervous system is already dysregulated. And then the loud noise is like taking a dysregulated nervous system and it's making it more dysregulated. And so, yes, the, the noise is an irritant, but if we can really regulate the system, we can change how it's then responding to, to that noise. Um, someone else was asking about CRPS. I'm a, I'm always a bit nervous with acronyms because sometimes I've people ask for acronyms and I answer the wrong acronym. So, so, so to say, I'm assuming they mean complex regional pain syndrome, but they might need something something else. And if they do, you, you can let that me know. Sounds likely. So, yeah. so, so oh, well. again, it, it it's like if you're working with with pain. Yeah, so yeah, good. So if you're working with ongoing pain, how we respond to that pain. Is really important if we have it's what's called it's what's called the pain loop if we have pain 
and we have a reaction to the pain, we cause more tension and therefore we drive more pain. If we can break that cycle, we may still have the pain, but we can at the least change our relationship with the pain. But working with the reset program of chronic pain people for many years, we often find that we can also have a direct impact on the pain. And the other one, just quick, please, I don't want to hijack the, the questions, but the other one quickly I just want to speak to as well, is someone's asking about, um, is it like um, DNRS or the Gupta program? So just to very quickly speak to that. There's a bunch of programs that are particularly focused on the thought patterns, like the habits, the thoughts that are driving the dysregulation in the nervous system. And that's a really important piece of the jigsaw. But from my perspective, it is a piece of the jigsaw, not the whole jigsaw. What we found is, yes, we need to work with that piece, and we do that within the reset program, but we also need to do the emotional healing work. If we don't do the emotional healing work, we find people that have done some of these other programs years down the path, still hours a day working at resetting their system and wondering why it's not learning to be in a safe, calmer state. And it's normally because there's a defensive mechanism against those, those, those traumas and emotions. And so for us, we need to work with each of those pieces for it ultimately to be effective. Yeah, I, I would second that emotion very strongly. I have met, again, many people who've meditated their whole lives, but they've never dealt with the emotional state. So they're always trying to compensate. And that's not getting back to health. And that's what's so important is these core, I don't call them wounds, but just we all suffer them. Those all places where we weren't seen. Um, they are our life's work. But in this modern age, we don't have the time because we get to keep our minds busy with our work or with TV or now these days with uh, TikTok, TikTok or whatever, or illness. All things distract from being present to who we are in relationship with the people around us. And that's the work. And but it, but when you're really sick, you often you have to mix that with the self-regulation techniques that are that I that I think Alex has put together so nicely and um and using ideas from lots of programs. But there was um one thing there was um just just the idea people always wonder how much do I have to do, you know, and how can I measure where I am? And before I, I before I answer that, I'll let you take a shot at it. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, so in the reset program, um, we give you a bunch of ways to assess how your nervous system currently is. So you can also see the impact and the progress that you're making. There are people that come in and with the 12 within the 12 weeks of the program, they get a major shift in their nervous system that also results in a major shift in their symptoms. There are other people that come in that get the major shift in their nervous system and it takes some more time for their symptoms to shift. And there are people that come in, it takes more than the 12 weeks to get a major shift in their nervous system. The program that we offer um, has lifetime access. So there isn't like a forced timeline. We, we, we structure it as a module a week for 12 weeks. For some people, that's too far. Some people do a module a month or a module a fortnight. Um, it's also worth saying that um, in the link that um, is being posted in the chat, and I'm sure people watching on replay, I'm sure they'll have the link there. We also have a significant discount for your community to make help make it more accessible. It goes back to the, the question you asked earlier, Eric, about people that are very limited in their own resources. It's really important to me to find ways to make this work accessible. So it's worth just pointing to that as well. Okay. And, and just one thing before we go is that I, I, I was fooled too. The, um, the, the, the acronym was Complex Childhood Post-Traumatic Stress Disorder. Which I, I think, no, I think that, that, that was, was a, different a different question. Different, yeah, different, different, different question. question. Anyway, but, but, complex but, regional pain. So, yeah. Anyway, but the point is, I, from my perspective, is that what we're talking about is not healing any one particular thing. OK, this is just getting the healing ability of the body back online. OK, because when we're chronically ill, we have we are now in the world of compensation. I just want to emphasize that again and again, is that your system is on a well, in the old computer, a do loop. It's going around a circle that is not getting you where you need to go. And you have to develop tools that will 
help you help your physical body, your emotional body, the thinking, get off that path, okay? Because the path you are on is unfortunately a circle. Chronic inflammation is a circle. It's self fulfilling. We 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 and and your body compensates so we doesn't you don't kill yourself with it. Um, that's the sort of the good side and bad side of chronic inflammation. Rarely does it kill us directly. I mean, secondary things can. Um, but so it's not for a disease. It's for how to live your life fuller. And when you're sick, if you can find some place to get some space from the noise in your brain that says, I'm sick and I can't get better. I'm sick and I can't get better and everything sucks. If we can change that for a while, it allows energy to flow and new things are possible on the physical plane. Okay, that's the thing. There's no, there, there, the, the, the physical and the emotional planes are not, well, for most of us, thank God, they're not linear. They're not tightly linked. Sometimes when you get really sick, they can get that way. And that's really a problem. But for most of us, they're kind of vaguely linked, but they're linked. And if you're always worried and depressed and angry and anxious, and you never have feelings of just open your heart and feeling joy and appreciation and love in the midst of your suffering, it's hard to get better. Not impossible, but it's harder. So, I mean, that's what this is about. It's not any one disease and it's not about how long you meditate. Some people can meditate five minutes a day and some people can meditate five hours a day. They're probably going for different purposes, but for quieting your mind, your nervous system, you know, for me, if I do five minutes, I actually quiet down. But anyway, so um, Alex, you want to wrap up? I I, I'm, I just, yeah. just like to like, I want yeah, yeah. I the theme for a lot of these questions. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I just want to respond to a couple of comments in the chat around the link that's been shared. Um, some of the, the buttons that jump down to the payment buttons are not jumping down. Um, we'll get that fixed in the coming probably 20 minutes or so. But if you just scroll down further down the page where it actually has the payment buttons, those payment buttons do work. Um, so you can enroll for the program. It's just further up where it's got some buttons that say, join the reset program now. You just need to keep scrolling down the page. And then when you get further down where it's actually got the, the options to select your um, type of payment or your currency, um, those payment buttons are working just fine. Um, but we will make sure that we get those other bits sorted um, very, very quickly. Um, I just want to say, Eric, it's been, and someone's asking about the discount. The discount's already applied to that page. Um, so you'll see see that there. Um, I just want to say, Eric, thank you for having me. Um, this was a really fun conversation. Um, I really appreciate you and your work that you're doing. Um, and I just want to really echo the point that we've been making, which is that this is not an alternative. It's not a replacement. It's a way to help really support that work and to really bring the nervous system piece into that healing healing journey. Yes. Thank you, Alex. I, I, I appreciate, and I, I said, I appreciate your work because you, I think, put a lot of the pieces together in one place that allows people to, um, to find a little help in this, in this difficult world. And, uh, and I, I think it's a program you, you have it for, for uh, people with chronic illness. I think it's one that uh, um, should be out there for everyone. So thank you. Thank you for your work and your time and uh thank everyone for attending i really appreciate it um and uh i hope maybe we can get to some of the questions uh at another time because they're they're all i said i wish we could do this maybe just all one time just riffing off the questions because i think when we hear these questions we're seeing what people aren't hearing and that's really important so thank you thank you alex thanks eric